Hi guys, welcome back to Infinite Possibilities, the podcast where we explore the lives of amazing people, their choices, challenges and opportunities. And today I have a very special guest, Stan. Hello, hello. Nice <laughs> to meet you, uh, everybody. And uh, hello, Karen. <laughs> thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for being here at this crazy time of year. Everyone's packing up for holidays and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, just about survive the semester and, oh. get, and getting ready to uh, unwind <laughs> and enjoy Christmas and, and some holiday time. Yeah, sounds good. So, Stan, what's your sort of one-minute introduction about what you do? <laughs> I am an associate press professor in information systems at University of Queensland Business School. That's how I met Karen. I think yeah. I met you at a seminar on qualitative field research. Is that correct? In, okay. in, as part of your honours? Um, I actually don't remember what the topic was, but I okay. remember you came in as a guest speaker. That's and right. And then we just like, I think you talked about like consulting That's at that right. Time. Th that's right. Consulting and, and my experiences in, in doing research and consulting. Um, so the type of research I do is it's kind of social and behavioral understanding the impact of new technologies in organizations or on people or on governments or on, um, and in different settings as well. So for example, I do lots of research in developing countries. I do lots of research with emergency, re emergency response organizations, but also large and small organizations as well, trying to help them make sense of the opportunities around new technologies. Yeah, sounds good. So we're going to go back to the start to see what kind of childhood you okay. had. So Stan, like, you know, where were you born and what was it like? I, I was born in Melbourne, so oh, uh, really? in Victoria, yes. Oh, I, cool. I have a Greek background, so my, my parents are Greek. I have a Greek background, I have a Greek citizenship as well. Uh, I think I had a very uh, unspectacular childhood. Uh, <laughs> Quite normal, grew up with, uh, with my family, brother and sister uh, in Melbourne. I went to primary school and, and high school there. Um, I guess a very typical young, young boy, very much into sports, into uh, comic books, superheroes. <laughs> um, Love it. And I guess I was not very academic. I, that wouldn't say I disliked school, but I really just wanted to play soccer all the time oh. uh, and play video games all the time. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's my, my early childhood. Um, what about in terms of personality-wise? I think personality-wise, I was um, a mixture of quiet and, oh. uh, and open, right? It, was, it really, really depended on where I was, who I was with, what the context was. So uh, like a normal boy, if everyone was excited and there was a pool party or something like that, I'd, I'd be crazy <laughs> with everybody else. If the, by chance I was in a scenario where I didn't know anybody, then probably I'd be a bit more reserved um, and quieter. Yeah, that's cool. And so when you were in high school, like in terms of career, did you have any sort of idea of like what you wanted to do? No, certainly not. I, I can't remember any particular career path that I was interested <laughs> in beyond, be, beyond being a, a soccer player. So <gasps> I, I looked to my brother and sister, to see, they were older than me, yeah. and I probably t learned from what they were doing and probably wanted to, to follow them in their footsteps. But in terms of, you know, wanting to be a doctor or wanting to be an academic or wanting to be an accountant <laughs> or wanting to be a, a, a builder, no, there was nothing really that that, um, that took my fancy at, at all. Yeah, wow. And so when it came time for you to sort of submit your university application, what was, <laughs> what did you put down, I guess? I, um, I think I followed in the footsteps of my, my brother and sister and, and chose a, a kind of safe business type of degree. Uh. Um, and I was interested in computers and, and IT, so information systems made sense, and that's what I chose to do. Um, but even then, you know, I, I couldn't really envision what a career in, in this in in that area looked like, and, and if, it, if it even if it was something that I wanted to do. Yeah, interesting. So I'm kind of curious. What did your brother and sister end up putting down? I think my, my brother certainly did information systems. Oh, uh, nice. My sister, I think, was business HR. Oh, um, very busy. And, and I guess the, the turning point for me was when I was 18, I think, or, or, or 19. I can't remember now. I might have even been 17. Wow. But, but I think, no, I must have been 18. So what happened was uh, up until then I'd work, you know, your average jobs. I did some work in a factory, you know, on the summer holidays. I, when I was younger, I did like a chemist around delivering medicine on, on, on my bike. And when I was 18, I, I managed to get a job at a firm called JB Ware which is a, one of the large financial institutions in, in Victoria. I think it's Goldman Sachs JB Ware now. I, I could be mistaken. Um, I think that they merged with, with Goldman Sachs some time ago. And um, there my job was uh, to work in IT as an IT administrator. So mm. my role was to uh, turn up at night time. I think my shift started at 7 p.m. or 5 p.m. Oh, sometimes. And uh, 
do things like run batch programs. So in those days, to, to, to run a backup or to run a print job, you'd have to run it manually and monitor it manually. I'd have to print some reports on these really big printers as well. Um, and I worked with a really fun IT team, and that really got me interested uh, in, in working in IT more, but also understanding how IT was uh, the lifeblood of an organization, how important it was, and also um, starting to think about designing better ways of, of uh, developing systems and, and processes, et cetera. Yeah, interesting. And were you a night owl? Because like 7 p.m. De yeah, definitely was a, a night owl. <laughs> definitely was a night owl. It really, it really fit very well with my, my lifestyle. Um, I could uh, study during the day, or play sports during the day, yeah. work at night time, and because I was such a night owl, uh, I could work from 7 p.m. to midnight and still go out for a few drinks with my friends wow. afterwards or you know, whatever was happening afterwards as well. Um, so it really worked very well. Yeah, and you said at the time when you applied, it was, what is it called, JB, and then it merged with... JBWare, yes. And oh, and then later it merged... merged with Goldman Sachs, I believe, or was bought out by Goldman Sachs, yeah. Oh, was that like bought out during your time? No, that was afterwards. Um, after some, some time afterwards, and I, I, I don't actually know what the, what the badging is at the moment. It may, yeah. it may have gone back to JBWare. So, uh, and and I did enjoy working in in the finance sector as as well. Uh, later on in, in my life as well, I worked for another another company in the finance sector that was developing software for financial institutions. Oh. So I guess there's no coincidence there that I that there was a link there between um, yeah. those those jobs in that way. Oh, that's cool. So when you did so IT administration, that's sort of pretty much like sort of IT help desk. Kind no, of thing, no, was, was, no, 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 certainly no help desk type of stuff involved. It was operations. Um, so really running systems, uh, running um, backup jobs, running batch jobs or programs that run overnight, running print jobs, collecting those print jobs. And, and things like that. I, th those roles don't really exist anymore. Yeah, that's kind of um, interesting. So they're, they're, they're quite old roles. The, I also designed a access database uh, from memory, which was to record batch jobs and what times they were meant to start and finish and, and, and so on and, and their details. Wow. Um, so a really fun job doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. I bet all those roles are, are typically automated now. You certainly wouldn't have people <laughs> sitting at a computer running uh, programs overnight. Um, but the interesting thing was that job and my degree coincided with one another. So yeah. I was doing an information systems degree and, and working in IT. Um, and I enjoyed the, the working more so than, than the studying. Ah. Um, but they, they, they fed each other very well. Um, I probably worked too many hours, but, it was a, <laughs> but, but for me, it was a good opportunity to, to build my career. So possibly my grades suffered from me working too much, but yeah. um, that was a trade-off I was happy to take at the time. Yeah, and so kind of curious, what was the, were you working like three, four times a week? No, I was or? working f f three or four times a week to begin with. Yeah. At one stage, I changed to five days a week as wow. well. Wow. Um, I think that was in my honours year. Um, yeah, I think there was one or two of us working uh, alternate nights for a bit of time. That person left and I was happy to do it for five nights a week. Wow, nice. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious about like... Um, sort of what was running through your mind when you were sort of applying? Because I know a lot of people, when they're 18, you know, their default is to work at Kmart, Woolworths. Yeah. And then it's pretty cool that you actually got a job that is like in your field. Yeah, I think around that time, there was a boom in IT. So probably there wasn't enough uh, uh. IT staff available. So they just needed a body that they could train and, and that happened to me me. I knew someone there at the time who told me about the job. Yeah. So probably there was no way I would have applied for that in... in uh, as a young man by myself, but yeah. someone said, hey, there's a position here, would you be interested in applying? So I applied. I remember I went to an interview wearing a suit that was far too big for me <laughs> um, yeah, and being very nervous, but I, I was successful. Um, and, and I did grow into that role as well. I certainly did grow and I'm quite, quite thankful for the opportunity as well. Yeah, and it sounds like, damn, you were given like quite a lot of responsibility from a young age. Yes, 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 you know, there, there was always people there working with me. Yeah. So um, I was always, especially to start the most junior person. So yeah. if things did go wrong, there was always someone to default to. Uh, and I do remember we had a TV there and I remember watching Seinfeld with the guys and yeah. we'd have pizza in the evenings and, <laughs> oh, and, and things like so that. So cool. it was a good, good work environment. Yeah, and so how long did you stay for there? I stayed there for some time. I think I started in 1999 there. Yeah. And I stayed until 2003, uh, wow. which coincided with the period um, when I finished my honours. Yeah. There was a full-time position there that I think I was considering. Um, but then I, I, I reached a period where I had to make a choice of whether I would want to stay there and build my career further 
or since I had um, finished my honours um, and I'd saved a bit of money, do I then travel mm. and try to look for other opportunities? And, and I ultimately chose to travel and look for other opportunities. Wow, very cool. And also just curious to rewind a little bit. So you said you did your thesis and you did honours. So I guess you weren't particularly enjoying Infosys at that time. So like what, like why, why do your thesis? Why do honours? Why put um, yourself through the pain? I think um, I was um, growing more into the academic role. So I think maybe some people thrive at university from their first year. I started yeah. to thrive perhaps in my third year. I saw the connections with my work. And also because that that job I had was eff effectively a full-time position that I could do at night time. Yeah. And I could study during the day. So the two worked very well together. Yeah. So I thought, well, let's continue going. Yeah, wow. And what did you write your thesis on? I wrote my thesis then you remember. on... Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it was a... It was a decision chart for uh, websites on how they <laughs> should, what products they should sell online, something, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, um, it, was, it was quite a basic thesis. Um, and I really couldn't tell you much about it other than that. Yeah, okay, that's cool. And then tell me more about traveling. So then I decided to start traveling, uh, like many people around that time. Um, head to Southeast Asia as a starting point. Thailand yeah. was a starting point. Oh. I think that Vietnam was a starting point then. Oh, cool. uh, and then figure it out from there. Um, you know, it was quite fun traveling in those times. There was no, no smartphones. Yeah. Uh, there was internet in internet cafes. There was yeah. certainly no internet in the hostels, <laughs> only at the internet cafes. Um, and everyone just wandered around with a Lonely Planet guidebook. You'd arrive at an airport uh, <laughs> and you'd figure it out. You'd just go somewhere and you'd figure it out step by step. And it was quite fun. It was a, a real adventure. Um, no Facebook, no, no Instagram, no posing wow. for photos. Yeah. Um, it was fantastic. It really was a real, real adventure. You have to uncover things and discover things for yourself. And I think that the, the journey was Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Laos, India, Nepal. Wow. Then Greece, Egypt, Jordan, Israel. Back to Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, back to India, jumped over Pakistan, back to India, Thailand, then home. I may have missed it one or two countries then. Uh, oh my gosh. And that, that journey took about a year or something like that. Wow, you were productive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, I loved traveling. I loved the adventure. Um, and at the time too, I was thinking about what, I, what did I want to do afterwards and, yeah. and um and research was um, growing more and more in my mind. Doing a PhD was growing more, more and Ooh. more in my mind. And I think I met some people there that were doing a PhD or they were possibly f finished their PhD and were traveling. And that really helped with my decision making as well. Oh, wow. And just wondering, did you go by yourself or did you have friends? I, I started with my, my partner, yeah. um, my girlfriend. Then I was by myself with some friends, then my, my partner came again, and then she left again. Um, so a, a mixture, a mixture of, of being by myself, being with my partner, being with some friends, and uh, I'm sure it's the same now, you go backpacking, you, you, meet, yeah. you meet people straight away anyway. In a hostel, you can't help but, but, but meet people. Yeah, and how hard was it to like, tell your parents that you wanted to you know, go traveling, and um, they can't really reach you like they can nowadays? Yeah, um, <laughs> They were, they were pretty okay with it, considering they were quite strict. I think um, yeah, they, nice. they were fine with it. I was gone for a year. And, and, and actually, I did see them in Greece. We, we did meet in Greece. <laughs> um, but even that, like, I, I don't even know how we managed to organize to meet uh, in a village in Greece yeah. at a particular period of time because I didn't have a mobile phone. My only yeah. communication was really um, email through an internet cafe. They didn't use email then either, right? So I'm not sure how we managed to pull that up, but it, but it worked out very well. Yeah, came back all yes, in one piece. Yes, yes, came back all in one piece. And it was good fun, you know. Uh, I really, I, I opened up, exposing myself to cultures. I, I think I was quite sheltered as a child, so we didn't really travel much. Um, yeah. uh, and obviously, Melbourne is a very multicultural place, and I had lots of friends from different parts of the world, etc. But it doesn't really compete to, um, or compare to, to traveling by yourself and, 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 exp and experiencing those different cultures um, firsthand. Yeah, and kind of curious. So a lot of people, you know, after uni, they go for one year, and they do like a bit of soul searching. So I'm kind of like interested in like the before and after. So what really did change, um, if anything? What changed? I think I was more independent afterwards, yeah. uh, more confident as well. 
yeah. and really seeking more and more adventure. Like, you know, I, I couldn't get enough. Like, for example, uh, trekking in Nepal to me was a, a life changing experience. I, I really love just walking for three weeks in the mountains. Wow. Um, that was that was uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, just more confident, uh, more open. Um, and more adventurous as well, I'd say, yeah. Wow. Did you have any sort of downtime where you were like, oh, I'm just staying one, like, put in one Yeah, there, there was places where we stayed for a few weeks at a time. Um, for example, I, sp I spent some time with family in Greece, and that was yeah. quite, quite nice. That was my first time in Greece, even though, even though I have yeah. a Greek background. Um, there was a period where we stayed in Dahab in Egypt by yeah. the Red Sea, and snorkeling and scuba diving, just chilling out there yeah. for weeks at a time. The same in um, Pokhara, which is a, a lake at the bottom of uh, the Himalayas. Yeah. After three weeks of trekking, just spending a bit of time there, um, uh, repairing our bodies and recovering yeah. from, from all the trekking, which was great, yeah. Did you have any sort of scary, like, near-death experiences? <laughs> near-death near experiences? Uh, I'm sure there was a few, actually. Oh so there were some interesting things where, for example, um, crossing over the border. I can't remember exactly where I was. I think it was the King Hussein Bridge in Jordan, <laughs> over from Jordan to Israel. Um, at some point, everyone had to get off the, the, uh, off the, get off the bus and, sh and show their passports. And then everyone was allowed to get back on the bus and cross over into Israel, except for me. Um, some security forces came and took <gasps> me away. They took me into a room and asked me some questions. Um, <gasps> and that was... Uh, that was a, a little bit scary, but because I was quite confident, confident in like I'd done nothing wrong, and I'm sure this is a procedural thing, I quite enjoyed the experience as well. That's the kind of person I was at the time. Oh, that's um, so funny. And look, and, and those, the security forces were fine. I mean, I had an Australian passport. I think that they were curious as to why I had a Greek name and, yeah. and why I had an Australian passport. I think po possibly more so the red flags were that I'd traveled through Jordan and, and Egypt and been to other places as well. So um, that was quite interesting. Um, yeah, and also we got the downtime. I just remembered. I think it was uh, I forgot the name of the island. Was it Sipidan Islands? No, it was it Sipidan Islands? Some islands off the coast of Thailand. We were dropped off by some guy in a boat. Uh, <laughs> there was nothing on the island, uh, and my friend Eddie, a Swedish guy, and I just stayed on the island for about a week um, with a hammock, some food we'd taken with us. Uh, I don't even remember how we organized someone to pick us up again in the boat. Whoa. But someone came and took us away uh, about a week later. It was great. Just the, just the two of us there chilling out. Wow. That's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't scared at all. Um, I, I guess it could have got, gotten scary. Yeah. But, um, but no, you have a friend. At, at, it makes yeah, everything yeah, for fun. Yeah, sure, for sure. At the time, it, it was fine. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any sort of like favorite memories as well? I think um, trekking in the pool to me, well, it was quite... Um, quite a nice moment. Uh, I remember meeting my grandmother for the first time. Aww. You know, I was tw in my 20s, I can't remember if I was 21, 22, yeah. whatever. Uh, and she picked me up from, she was quite old at the time, she picked me up from the bus stop in her village yeah. and she walked with me hand in hand back to her house, Aww, which, is, which, so which is very nice, yeah. Um, yeah. My Greek wasn't so good at the time, so we had some <laughs> communication problems and she spoke no English, but it was good fun. It was really good fun. Um, yeah, yeah th those moments were, were really fantastic. Yeah, and I guess since you did one year of traveling, were there times where you're like, oh, you know, like halfway through, you're like, oh, I'm done. Time no, to go not ahead. at all. In fact, uh, I regretted coming back at the time. Oh I, I, I really wanted to keep going. Um, and I'm quite, I guess I'm quite fortunate. I did manage to have large periods of travel again later on in my life as well. Yeah, okay. And tell me about returning. Like, what was it like returning to sort of mundane, boring? Yeah, I think it was just, um, you know, you're a young person. Um, you want things to keep happening at a fast pace. You yeah. want the adventure. You want the co the uh, constant um, um, engagement with people, fresh things happening. Uh, so that stopped. But then I, I commenced my PhD uh, <laughs> at, at that time. Um, and I tried to be a little bit too clever. And I remember I started my PhD full time, but I was working roughly full time as well. And I thought, I'll be fine. I'll manage the two together. And I remember about three months into it, I was at my girlfriend's house and I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, got changed in my work clothes oh my and, and left to go to work. Uh, and I went outside. It was dark, but I didn't even pay attention. I think I even left the, the driveway and then I re realized, hang on a minute, it's like two or three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And that's when I realized I'd become a bit like a robot. 
and it probably wasn't manageable to, to, to do the two. So then I wound down to part-time work and finally gave up the work and, and focused full-time on my PhD. Um, but my PhD also, it was on um, the adoption of the internet and e-commerce by small firms in developing countries, particularly tourism firms, and how it helped them uh. with development of their organizations. Uh, and that also allowed me to travel. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if that was coincidence now. I, I don't think it was coincidence. I think it was partly me trying to find uh, opportunities. Find opportunities. <laughs> yeah, so that took me to Malaysia where I did uh, some field research and I, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and part of the reason I focus on uh, tourism firms is because I knew they'd speak English, right? Uh, so yeah. rather than small firms in general. So yeah. spent some time in Malaysia, spent some time in Ecuador interviewing small firms and that was really oh. fantastic. Um, and allowed me to continue to travel obviously as well. Yeah. And as part of that, because my research was focused on development, I participated in a three week or four week United Nations development program wow. where we spent uh, that time in Geneva. Uh, and I think it was quite an exclusive program um, whereby there was only two people there from Australia, roughly one or two from a range of different countries in the world. And you had to either be a PhD student or a young diplomat, I think that was called. Uh, and pass certain criteria to, to, get, to get it to be invited. So we spent three weeks together l learning about the United Nations, writing reports for the United Nations, um, and working together. And again, that was a, a, a real good opportunity, and so, something I'm, I, I'm really fond of at that time, yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah, because a lot of the times when I talk to people about PhDs, they just give me one advice, don't do it. Yes, so I mean, uh, yeah. yeah um, look, uh, the thing about a PhD is that if you're doing a PhD, you're not doing something else, uh, right? So, cost. yeah, there's the opportunity cost, there's a, tra there's a trade off. One door opens, but maybe three or four doors are closed, right? Yeah. So, if you see yourself working in industry um, as a practitioner, I don't know, as a IT manager or HR manager or I don't know, whatever it is, to move into a PhD means you might be closing that door. Yeah. So when you commenced your PhD, you sort of already in your mind closed the door to industry. Yes, uh, I wanted to be, to be to stay in the development sector, and I wanted I knew I wanted to be doing consulting with United Nations, etc. Um, but what I found um, pretty quickly was that it's very difficult to break into that sector. Mm. Uh, I must have applied for I'm not exaggerating 50 to 100 <sighs> consulting jobs. Uh, and was turned down by by all of them. I'm, I'm not even sure if I even got a reply for most of the time. Um, looking back now, there's probably things I could have done better in my CV, but um, there was a lot of young people that want to get into that space. Yeah. Many of them speak three, four, five languages. Yeah. Many of them had a better education than me. Uh, many of them had opportunity to do internships, etc. in Europe. Being in Australia means you can't really get those opportunities. And even if there is an internship opportunity, you have to pay a lot of money to, 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 to do that, uh, which might not be the case if you live in France or Italy, etc. cetera. Um, so, so that I found um, to close that door to me, but I had my PhD, I was doing research, so I could, I could easily- Open just, that door again. Yeah, open that door again. So I didn't really lose anything out. Like the, the, there was a, a period where I could do one or the other. So the consulting didn't work out, so I, I kept doing the research, that, that, so that worked out okay. Interestingly enough, about five years later, uh, I found that those development organizations like United Nations were coming to me <gasps> oh, for consulting. That's so uh, so um, yeah, it was quite interesting. Like, in fact, I wouldn't even have to apply. They'd come to me and say, "Hey, would you mind doing this piece of research for us? Or would you mind? Oh. Are you available to do this for this for us? Or can you come give a talk, etc." So, um, <laughs> it's funny that it worked out that way. Yeah, and can you tell me more about what exactly is the development sector and why you are so like passionate about that area? So, in um, the development sector is quite broad, right? It's to do with yeah. anything with uh, social and economic development yeah. um, ar around the world. It doesn't have to be in, in developing countries. It can be uh, other parts, other parts of the world as well. But it's so in, in my interest, in particular, because I like technology. I was interested in how technology can be used to improve the livelihoods of people in developing ah. countries, whether it's farmers in, in in Africa, whether it's the informal sector, um, entrepreneurs, and so on. I was interested in how technology allows people or creates opportunities for economic empowerment for for people. Yeah, cool. And then tell me about the day when you handed in your PhD and you finished. Uh, yeah, that? people talk a lot about that day. I don't particularly find it uh, to be that exciting. I, I remember printing it off. Um, <laughs> remember handing it in. I think I, I think I remember handing it in. And <laughs> Good then job. yeah, I wasn't that excited about it. 
I was more excited that I think I submitted it in January 2008. I was more yeah. excited about um, going traveling again <laughs> straight after. So there was a, there was a, I was quite lucky. I finished my PhD. I had a job lined up at the University of Leeds yeah. in the UK. Uh, and I had a period of three or four months of traveling wow. in Central America beforehand. So, uh, and, and in fact, even my visa to work in the UK uh, arrived for me when I was in Mexico. It was delivered oh. by uh, DHL or something like that, yeah, to oh, me there. Damn. So, um, it was fun, yeah, it, it, was, it was a fun time. Uh, we traveled through Mexico, Guatemala, Belize. Um, then we head over to the UK. I didn't know anything about Leeds, in fact, when, when I was in Melbourne, people were telling me, don't go to Leeds, it's backwards, it's industrial, etc. Yeah. But I think they remember it like it was like um, uh, 20, 30 years ago. But when I got there, we, my, 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 my girlfriend and I, who's now my wife, we absolutely yeah. loved it. We, we loved it so much. We, we, we were really fond of the place. We made good friends. We loved the university. Um, academia in the UK was quite different to what I was used to in Australia, yeah. but it really fit with me. Like it was part of your identity. It wasn't just something, a job. It was part of your identity. Um, staff and students lived around the university. Oh. It was a nice small city as well, Leeds. Um, and it was great, a bit rough around the edges, which I quite liked as well. <laughs> but, it, but it was a, a real fun, a real fun time. Um, so that lasted about a year and a half. At the time, I didn't have a Greek passport. So um, when my visa expired, um, we decided to go travel again. So we traveled again for a few months. Um, we traveled to Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and Argentina, and that took about I don't know four months, five months perhaps overland. Um, and there was a lot of lot of bus trips there because it was all overland. It's a long way. Then we came back to Melbourne, uh, and we decided that we wanted to go back to Leeds again. So <laughs> another another opportunity came up in Leeds, and we went back for another six years or so at, at the University wow, of Leeds. Wow, six yeah. years is a long time. Yeah, and um, we had our first child in in Leeds, and yeah. returned wow. to Melbourne. Um, after the birth of our first child. I think he was one years old when we, when we came back. Yeah. And then when we, when we came back in Melbourne, we actually decided that we preferred Leeds. But um, <laughs> then, um, and then Brexit happened, or was mm. happening, and we had a second child. Um, and after fusing Melbourne, opportunity at University of Queensland uh, uh, popped up and I took it. And um, despite all my worldly experiences, I didn't have much experience of Brisbane or, or Queensland had to offer. Yeah. So Queensland has been a, a fantastic surprise to us. We, we absolutely love living here. It's been, oh. been over about two years now. Interesting, yeah, because a lot of people when they come to Brisbane, they find it a little bit boring. <laughs> yes, so. you know, gr growing up in um, <laughs> Melbourne, I, I imagine the same in Sydney. Yeah. Um, you grow up uh, with people telling her that Brisbane's backwards, yeah. that Brisbane's boring, yeah. um, etc. Uh, and I guess it might be the same in the UK. Uh, people in London might think the same about Liverpool or Leeds yeah. or Sheffield, those northern cities. Um, but I don't know if things have changed or if the perception was wrong, but uh, we absolutely love it. Yeah. We lo love the weather, uh, love the lifestyle. Uh, I don't really see much difference between the people in, in Melbourne and, and Brisbane. It's much of muchness to me. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, great. That's cool. And I'm kind of curious, like, you know, being a lecturer, like, I feel like you don't get that sort of excitement that you love from traveling. So do you, like, how do you, like, does the job get mundane? Um, I think we're, we're quite lucky. I've been quite lucky in that with my UK um, connections and my European connections, I pre-COVID, I was traveling, even from Australia, I was traveling to Europe two or three times a year, maybe once to the USA, maybe once to Asia as well. Um, so there, there was still lots of opportunity to travel, but it, it being such a long way and having a family meant that I was just um, going and coming back very quickly. And it wasn't particularly, it was good to be there, but it wasn't a particularly enjoyable trip, I, I would say. So for example, once I went to Austria for four nights or three nights, once I went to, to Switzerland for three nights and I'd come back, um, you know, they're lightning chips. You, you, it's hard to recover from, from from that from the jet lag uh, especially when you have young kids you have to look after them as well yeah so even though there was opportunities i think it was, it was quite quite hard as well oh, and so now do you think you've got the travel bug out of you uh, oh. no definitely not i think uh, definitely not having said that with covid 
Yeah. It's actually been nice in some ways to have an excuse not to travel. Yeah. Because uh, it, it, it can be quite difficult. But one thing I found, I'm sure my, my colleagues are the same, is that uh, being in Australia, we're a long way from our academic colleagues in Europe and the USA and Asia. Yeah. We do feel like we're being left out of certain conversations. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to conferences. Now, at the moment now, we have our um, premier uh, leading information systems conference. It's in, it's in Texas. Many people from, from, from Europe and probably Asia and the USA are there. We are not there. Obviously, we can't travel. So it is online. It's being held in a hybrid form. Yeah. But the time is midnight to 6 a.m. for us. Oh. And uh, after a long day of work, to to engage in some kind of intellectual conversation at 3 a.m. in the morning or 2 a.m. in the morning <laughs> is, is probably a, a, a asking too much of us. And we did it last year, but yeah. after two years of these kind of like late night meetings yeah. uh, and, and late night conferences, it, you, j you just get worn down. So unfortunately, I haven't really participated too much in that conference. Uh, I had two papers at that conference. My colleagues presented about 2 a.m. and I didn't get up to <laughs> even to support them. I just um, didn't have the energy energy to do that. Yeah, wow, interesting. Yeah, and I'm sort of curious to dig more into like why you love traveling because I find that like it's all exciting for one month and then like just the novelty wears off. It's like the same, it's like, yeah, it's like it's kind of the same, but yeah. You know. I think uh, a, a, other than those, so a lot of my traveling has been, I think, w with, with a purpose of, of some kind. So, oh. so uh, when I was collecting data as part of my PhD, I spent, yeah. I think, two months in Ecuador. Yeah. So I was staying with a family there. I was traveling as well uh, on the weekends, etc. But I, I was there to collect data and yeah. I was still, still working my PhD. I really loved that experience of, of being somewhere different but, but doing something. When I was in the UK, I was living and working there. I wasn't considering to be traveling. Um, yeah even though I would travel, et cetera, for holidays, but I wouldn't consider that traveling. And even with those longer trips, we often had a purpose of, let's say, to go from um, Mexico to Belize. And it was kind of like a journey where we wanted to, to do things or we had, we'd have a starting point and an end point rather than just going to a place and hanging out there for, for a while. Um, Having said that, I, I, don't, I don't mind going to places and hanging out for a while. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, if I could go to Bali, even Bali, to go there for two weeks now with the family and, and chill out would, would be fantastic. So. Um, no, it has not really been that period where I thought, no, this, this is boring. No, not, not at all for me. Really? Wow. Okay. Um, and how does um, solo travel compare with group travel? I, I love solo travel. I, I, oh. I really do, especially when I was younger. Maybe now, as I'm older, I prefer to have a companion, a companion with me uh, or my family with me. Yeah. Um, but when I was young, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. You would arrive at a place and um, you'd have to figure it out. Like, like I said, there, there was, you'd get to an airport, you'd put your headphones in, um, you'd sit on your backpack for a while, you'd get out the Lonely Planet guidebook. You know, it might have a bus schedule for there, right? So yeah. the bus schedule may or may not be accurate because it's in a book, right? And, and things yeah. change. And then you just figure it out. Um, I think being a young male makes a difference, obviously. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, th not you know, um, there's, there's less um, threat to me. Uh, that, that's my perception anyway. Yeah. And I think because of the way I, I look as well and the Mediterranean features, I kind, yeah. of, I kind of blended in in a lot of places. Like, wow. you know, when I was in Europe, I look European. When <laughs> I was in parts of the Middle East, I think I, I blended in parts of the Middle East. Yeah. When, I'm in, when I'm in South America, nobody could really tell if I was Argentinian or Chilean or whatever, right? So, oh, that's cool. uh, and even, even when I was in India, you know, uh, People just might even, might even you know, if I was in a group of Indian people, I might not even stand out. So, so there was that element as well. I always managed to blend in. Uh, and of course, being a male meant yeah. that um, there was probably less threat to me as well. So I could do things, you know, like, uh, like wing it, like uh, walk around at night time trying to find accommodation yeah. or um, not have a very strong plan, etc. Yeah, and just generally, like when you go traveling, how rigorous are your plans? Uh, with a family, they're pretty, rig pretty rigorous, <laughs> but when I was by myself and when I was younger, I would just say I will arrive in Delhi and I might have a hostel that I want to, want to go to uh, for the first few nights and that's it. Oh, so you just have like three days in advance. Maybe, if that. And some, sometimes, um, you know, I can remember cages where I've turned up in a city, I've got, enough, got, got off a train and uh, my friend and I, or the person I'm traveling with and I, we'll just go to where the hostels are and just walk around there and pick one. Oh, wow. Have you ever been like, sort of, can't find a place to sleep? Yeah, I remember once in, in, in I think it was in Turkey. Yeah. Um, we slept outside in some caves or something. I think it was in Cappadocia. <laughs> um, 
we slept that side. We, we slept on some mats and, and some some um, mats. What else did we have? Some, some sleeping bags and things like yeah. that. Um, yeah, you know, and I, but there's been some weird places I've slept to. Like in Thailand, I found a hostel once where the, the door wouldn't even close, like the like a normal door, but it's just impossible to close. So I slept yeah. with my bed up up against the the door for oh. actually extra bit of security. Yeah. Um, where else? Where else have I slept that was a bit a bit odd? Um, no, that, that's the only two that, that, that spring to mind, actually. But I always managed to find a place to stay, stay that was relatively safe. Yeah, that's cool. And just wondering, when you plan out your trips, what kind of person are you? Are you like more like a nature person? or? Yeah, certainly more, more nature person. I, I really enjoyed being outdoors, um, you know, particularly mountains. I, I really fell in love with mountains and, and forests, but also beaches as well. But having said that, I also love cities like, you know, um, leave me in Rome. I'd yeah. be very happy in, in, in Rome, right? R Rome to me is like an outdoor museum. Yeah. London as well. Um, some of the big American cities are you know, full of character. Um, yeah. Bangkok's a really crazy place, which, which I really enjoy, enjoy it as well. Yeah, so lots of these cities have a, a lot to offer as well, but certainly I would privilege nature over, over the cities. Ah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, something I can probably do because yeah. nature person. But I don't know. I'm just still not that big on traveling. So uh, well, I guess it's yeah. for every, everyone's different, right? Um, yeah. You know, there, there's there's no right right or wrong way of, of living, and, and the same goes for traveling. Some people like it, some people don't. And there's opportunity costs, right? If you're spending time and money traveling, you're yeah. probably not doing something that you, you you should be doing or that you prefer to do. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. But I mean. Since I've graduated, I might just try and yeah, sure. get back into sure. it while yeah. I can. Yeah, I, I do feel sorry for young people who, who have had to put their yeah, uh, plans. plans on, on hold um, and, and just try with one side of it as well. There's all sorts of opportunities that they've missed out on. Yeah. Hopefully th things get back to some kind of normality soon. Yeah, cool. And in terms of like, you said you did a bit of consulting and a bit of research. And then research maybe initially was what you used to sort of break back into consulting. So why stay after it? Yeah, so um, when I was at the University of Leeds, we, we had a spin-off consulting company. And I, that was a place to do some really interesting consulting with the emergency services like police, fire, ambulance around yeah. technology adoption for them. Um, and I, I quite enjoyed that short-term consulting opportunities. I did some stuff for some other development agencies as well in, in that period. Um, but by then I was quite well and truly entrenched in um, academia. And one thing I liked about academia, and I was quite fortunate, is that there was stability around work. Mm. Whereas with the consulting, it might've been like, hey, there's a, a three month stint of consulting in um, Geneva, then there might be six months in, in in Ghana, then it might be you know a year <laughs> in, in in Bangkok or something like that. So, uh, and there might be periods in between where there's nothing to do, right? So, yeah. I quite um, liked academia. I quite liked academia too, in that you were. I like the teaching side of it. I really enjoy oh. um, working with with undergraduates and postgraduates, but also like the research side of it in generating new knowledge, and that's what I, something that I like. It's, it's a creation of new knowledge, um, and. Yes, and I felt like at the same time to, to leave academia, again, there's opportunity costs, right? I could go yeah. into consulting full time. It may or may not work. There might be periods of gaps and I was getting older. So I think I prefer yeah. that stability. Um, I guess maybe I just got too comfortable in academia as well. Yeah, that's interesting because I was thinking like, you know, um, when you're talking about your childhood, you sound like a bit of like a adrenaline junkie. So you would have liked that, you know, three yeah, months uh, stint. Sure, but, sure. At, but, a of, at a period of time, yes. Yeah, yeah but the, probably like with family and stuff, yeah, it's just so much. No, uh, d definitely the case, yeah. Yeah, cool. And what about like in terms of teaching, like does it, like it gets really repetitive, sort of how do you sort of spice it up, keep it um, interesting in your... For me, um, I don't think it gets too repetitive, actually. Really? So, so it gets repetitive in that some of the content is the same yeah. semester after semester. Most of it should be the same. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I, I try to freshen things up a lot. Yeah. Um, for me, the 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 engagement, the interact, the interaction uh, comes from the students. So, 
if the students are participating in discussions, if they're engaging, if they're interacting, if they're, you know, and at, the, at the moment we're on Zoom, right? So yeah. if there's some questions in the chat box, it is even some banter in the yeah. chat box as well, you know, some jokes or some banter, some back and forth, that really freshens things up. So as long as that's there, I don't mind the content is the same because that discussion will always be dynamic. That discussion will always be different from semester to semester, from week to week, as different people ask things, as different people post things, et cetera. And, and that, that, that to me makes or breaks um, the, the experience of, of the course. Oh, have you had like a course where none of that happened? So far, no, I've been, I've been quite lucky. Oh. Uh, yeah, so far at UQ, uh, we've been really lucky with, with the students we've had in, in the level of interaction so much so I think there's more interaction in the chat box because yeah. I teach a big course with lots of students. Yeah. I think if you have undergraduates in a lecture theatre and you ask a question, nobody wants to raise their hand and, and yeah. answer in a lecture theatre. But on Zoom, there's l less risk, right? You can say whatever you like, it's yeah. easy to type, um, you don't have to worry about getting red-faced or yeah. your pronunciation. So I, I think it works really well on Zoom. Oh, so would you say you sort of almost preferred the Zoom teaching? For the, the lectures, I prefer Zoom. Yeah. Um, I suspect students prefer Zoom for the, the lectures. I, I yeah. can't speak for everyone, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the tutorials, it, it does make sense that they, they would be better face-to-face because -face, uh, I'd like to see what students are doing. Yeah, um, yeah but it's, it's been an interesting learning experience for everybody. Yeah, cool. And so how many people in one lecture and how many people like do you like generally would come to your consultation and sort of, because it sounds like a very much like a one-to-many relationship. So I wonder how many students um, you would actually get to know. So my lectures are up to 500 students oh my gosh. In, on Zoom. <laughs> you know, and the attendance is pretty good, right? So we will at least have 100 or so in, in every session, okay. which is better than you would might often get in, in a face-to-face -face scenario. Yeah. Um, and I, I do try to get to know the students, you know. I, I get... If they, if they are talking, if they are commenting in the chat box, if they turn on the microphones, they turn on the cameras, I will get to know them. It doesn't matter if there's 100 or 200. Yeah. Um, we're together for 13 weeks, so I, I, I do remember them. I have facilitators helping as well. So as a team, we get to know the students. Um, we don't get to know the students that don't interact, unfortunately, because yeah. uh, we can't see their faces. We can't just go up to them and ask them, hey, is everything okay? Uh, but certainly the students that are, that, are, that are there and engaging, we get to know them. Um, and we develop, develop, I think, good rapport with them. Oh, that's cool. And so you say 500 people in one lecture and then around 100 turn up. And then how, how many do you build rapport with? Because I don't think I could remember 100 students. Um, Is it like a 20 or like um, a Like I said, I think I, let's just say 30 or 40 of them are commenting. Yeah. I'll build a rapport with 30 or 40 oh, with all of them. That's actually pretty good. I, will rem I, will, I may struggle to remember their names <laughs> properly, properly, but I will... <laughs> Uh, I will be familiar with their name. So if, if they say, if they ask me a question about something they asked, I will know who they were. Um, sometimes I will say, hey, um, Karen said something two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, she made a good point about that. Let's discuss that more today. So yes, I certainly, um, I do remember. Um, and that's because we're having a discussion, right? If we're yeah. having a discussion, you rem remember people's names. Yeah, that's pretty good. Cool. And then, so just a random question. So whenever I go to like a job interview, they go like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? So since we're on this podcast, where do you see yourself in uh, 10 years? Hopefully I'm still at the University of Queensland. <laughs> but you, you never know, right? You, you really yeah. don't know. Um, yeah, I think you have to be open in, in life and in, and in your career because opportunities do arise. Um, but I, at, at the moment, if you ask me now, I'd be quite happy to be in this office um, <laughs> it, at the University of Queensland, um, doing what I'm doing, perhaps in a different capacity, but um, still here, still contributing. Um, and that's quite different to when I was in, in, you know, in my 20s, for example. Yeah. I'd probably want to be somewhere else in 10 yeah. years' time. But he, uh, here, no, it's, it's a great university, um, great students, beautiful campus. Um, so yes, certainly can see myself here in 10 years' time, but you, know, you, you, know, you never know. Yeah, cool. And so, Stan, the deep question. Okay, so, I, I'm, I'm um, ready for this. Yep. Let's go. So, what do you think the meaning of life is? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I know you asked me that earlier, and I didn't, I didn't have an answer then. I still don't have an answer now. Yeah, just um, your opinion. I don't. I don't really have an opinion on this. I, I really don't. Not. I mean, I, I've thought about it from time to time, um, and I think the meaning of life perhaps differs. On different stages of your life, right? So, oh, tell me about for, the transition. For, well, for, for me now, it's probably just to spend time with my family and see my boys grow up and, and uh, help them to be, you know, strong, um, strong kids, 
uh, and help them to enjoy their lives and achieve the best they can. If you ask me when in my 20s, probably to, um, you know, get as much adrenaline as possible and <laughs> take off as many dangerous things and climb as many mountains, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it, it really differs. Uh, and I don't really have any, any great insights. Um, you know, I'm actually reading a book now, uh, The Expanse, which is a... Um, a sci-fi series. I'm not sure if you, you know about the, the, the book and the, and the TV series. And there they and now in the final book, they're kind of going off and the, uh, answering these types of questions regarding the meaning of life with aliens yeah. and things like this. But um, it's all, I find it very fascinating. But I'm, I'm afraid. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I don't have any deep insights here, um, and I'm not sure if anybody really knows the answer to this question anyway. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious, like, how come you didn't end up pursuing that soccer player dream? Was that like... I probably wasn't... Easy answer, probably wasn't good enough. Right? <laughs> so, um, so I, uh, I wanted to be a soccer player. I probably got distracted in my late teens and early 20s. Yeah. Um, but I, I continued playing. I, I enjoyed good. it. I, I loved the sports. Um, and I think you should continue playing, whether you're a professional or not a professional, you, sh you should contribute to the sport. My kids play soccer now, and oh, I, I, love, I love being a part of that as well. So yeah, it's a great sport, um, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for the impact that sport has had on me as a, as a person. Yeah, that's cool. And so what is your ideal day in the life? Bet a bit of sports there. <laughs> uh, I think so. I mean, now I'm into running a lot. I do lots of ultra marathon running. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I, no, if, in, in one way I can answer that question is to run a 50-kilometer race or a 60-kilometer race in the mountains. That, that, oh is, that is an idea of a good time for me. Another would be to uh, spend a day at the beach with, with the kids. So um, they're both equally, equally quite good. Wow, cool. And then now we're pretty much at the end of the podcast. Sure. So I have to ask you, what has your experience been like? Oh, pretty good, actually. It's been pretty smooth. Yeah. Uh, some questions... Uh, I wasn't ready for, so I hope I've given you some, <laughs> no, some right fine, answers. Um, no right or wrong. No, no right, the useful answers, I, I should say. Um, yeah. It's been been enjoyable. I hope it's useful for, for your listeners. Yeah. And um, I haven't seen or heard who your other, podca oh. or other podcast guests have been. Yeah. Um, but I think, what's your name of your podcast? Amazing People or something like that? Infinite Possibilities. Infinite Possibilities. <laughs> um, I, my, my experience is certainly just one possibility. I'm going to say call it an amazing possibility. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, no, I haven't listened to your other, pod, uh, other podcasts, so, but maybe I, I will after this. Oh, yes. I'll send you a link to Michael Axelson's. Whoa. Oh, Michael Axelson's there as well. Great, great. Yeah. Yeah, now he's an interesting character, a great colleague, and he's been very helpful while, while I've been here. Yeah, that's good. So shout out to Michael if you're yeah, listening. Uh, hi, Michael, <laughs> yes. And it's actually his office is not so far away either. Yeah. So yeah, let's say bye. Okay, bye everybody.